trying to balance the budget. New Gingrich came up with cuts. They called him the Gingrich who stole Christmas. <laughs> And yet when the, the budget did get balanced, largely due to uh, the bubble economy that the Federal Reserve was creating, Bill Clinton got all the credit for that. So, right. yeah, you, you have this interesting uh, set of double, uh, you know, standards that they play by, and Donald Trump is not going to play by that standard. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, the fact that they made such a big deal that Trump used the word schlonged, okay, which people can see that that's a term that is used in, it's kind of a Yiddish term, it's used but the, the establishment media was using the term teabagging and yeah. calling these people yeah. teabaggers as yeah. if that wasn't an offensive term. That's that's totally okay mm -hmm. to bring that into the political lexicon. But, you know, don't say schlonged if you're talking and about that. And that doesn't have any budget. other context other than a scatological <laughs> one. Yeah, right? So yeah. exactly. No, so that's something that you can't. And then, of course, you know, we have, it's not just people uh, like Donald Trump. Of course, Rand Paul also brought this up, saying that the Democrats, how dare they talk about the war on women when the media has always covered up Bill Clinton's sexual assaults. Um, but also, too, Hillary Clinton was the one who first called all of these women coming after Bill bimbos. Yeah. And she, <laughs> she she was calling this the uh, the bimbo eruptions in the 90s. So these women have come out and, and said that, it, you know, shame on you. Hillary wrote the book on terrorizing women, and it's a joke that she would run on women's issues. So these are the women who were actually victimized by Bill Clinton. And so absolutely this should be brought up within this election cycle. It's very important. This is someone that's going to be in the White House. Yeah. Well, of course, it's not just the war on women, but of course the Democrats, as well as the Republican establishment, has been involved in a war on the working class. And I think that's what they're really worried about. Yeah. Those people are see how they've been eviscerated under the bipartisan policies. And the only person who is really pushing back against that uh, is Donald Trump. And that's what they're really worried about, because that's right. something that's going to break down. It's going to be like the uh, Reagan Democrats, I think, and when this comes to the general election. Thank you very much, Leanne. And when we come back, we're going to have some special reports and then an interview with Larry Pratt of Gun Owners of America talking about what's ahead in the coming year, the attacks on our freedom, the attacks on our legal system. You guys have the exclusive for, which is a product called Deep Cleanse. And why I'm so excited about it is it's a unique formula, almost like the iodine crystals. We have two unique products that nobody in the world has. One of the most amazing ingredients in the world, and it's called Shilajit. And it's actually known as blood of the mountain or rock sweat because thousands of years ago, as a matter of fact, this ingredient was only given to the elite of the elite. Thousands of years ago, up in the Himalayan mountains and in Tibet. And we wanted to put this in, in stuff for, for a couple of years, but we couldn't get an organic form. Right. I mean, so I, let's explain. I mean, we, this stuff's so good, we couldn't put it out for years. Right. So I had to actually, it's kind of like the iodine crystals, finding a source deep in the earth that we could get the cleanest source available. But in Tibet and in Nepal and in the Himalayan mountains, Thousands of years ago, they found, they watched these monkeys. And during the summer months, the monkeys would go up into the mountains. Now you're being racist against monkeys. And they would pick this black substance from the mountains. And so uh, in Russia, they actually, it, it grows in Russia in the mountains and in the Himalayas and only in the summer. And Chilajit is actually the decomposition of seven, up to 7,000 different medicinal herbs. So it decomposes, all these different herbs decompose in the Himalayan mountains and the volcanic soil up there. And what happens in the summertime- So it's almost like an oil up. from- Yes, it's high in fulvic acid, it's high in humic acid. Because they're, they're always claiming down. oil is really from decomposed animals and plants. There is some oil that is based from fossils, but most of it's really abiotic. But so, so this is a true fossil uh, source. I mean, explain it to me. It is. A, it's really the decomposition, like I said, of over seven thousand different medicinal herbs and plants. And it, and with the rocks and the pressure deep in the mountains, it freezes and. And during the summertime, and the pressures build it up, it oozes out. It oozes out. So it literally oozes out of the mountain. It's like rock sap. It's like rock sap. It's black, and it's highly nutritious. Uh, even in the 1980s, when the Olympic athletes in Russia were accused of being on steroids, they found out that they were actually been given shalajit because it it works as an anabolic as well. 
and it builds muscles. It's a big dose in there. The second big main ingredient in there is a volcanic zeolite concentrate. And this, what this formula is designed to do, the shilajit and the zeolites have a real strong negative charge. All the metals and chemicals and PCBs and VOCs have positive charges. So these go in, they grab it, and then they safely eliminate it through the body so you can become healthy. I mean, the, this is an amazing formula. I wish I actually had it, but because this was an exclusive InfoWars Life product, you're the only one in the world that has this formula now. And, uh, you know, there is going to be a limited supply available when you sell out because you can only harvest this once a year. How do people take it? How is it recommended that this be done? Just a daily, daily dose? Yeah, daily dose. Uh, the instructions are on the label. You know, of course, I, I kind of modify it for each individual. It depends on what your lifestyle is. I mean, the, honestly, the best thing to do is for you to avoid all these chemicals and toxins in your environment and try to identify them and start slowly reducing them. But personally, I, I'm going to probably take it every day, every other day, and I'll probably go with about a dropper full to maybe two dropper fulls. Uh, and I and I, li I don't expose myself to any chemicals. InfoWarsLife.com. Please also support our local AM and FM affiliates, support their local sponsors, or become a sponsor and spread the word. Because these aren't just great products. This is how we fund this independent operation. We're not taxpayer funded like MSNBC or NPR, and neither is your local station. So support them, folks. This is a war. <laughs> The use of TSA body scanners has been a very controversial topic, with privacy advocates stating that the machines show too much of one's person, health advocates and pregnant mothers concerned about the effects the machines can have on unborn children, citing how x-ray technicians use lead walls before they operate similar types of machinery. With all this in mind, the TSA has quietly phased out or is phasing out the opt-out option, stating how they can strongly suggest that somebody go through the machine as opposed to getting a pat down. So we're going to ask the people out here what they think about the new change in policy. Oh, excuse me, sir. We're asking people what they think about the TSA change in policy, eliminating the pat down option. I have not heard about that. Oh, well, I didn't have to go through security this morning, but you did. Um, I don't really. I think it's fine. Yeah. I think as long as they still do a thorough check, then it shouldn't be a problem for anybody. Uh, I actually go through some of the pre line, so I don't have that deal. So no, not worry about it. I do pre also do pre. because I come here too much. Well, some people are concerned. Uh, you see uh, pregnant mothers and health advocates, mm -hmm. they're concerned about the effects the machines can have on things such as unborn sure. children. Well, oh, okay. So you're talking about eliminating the ability to do a pat down in lieu of yes. the scanner? No, no, I think they need to keep it for that. Well, some people concerned, such as pregnant mothers and health advocates, they're worried about the effects that the body scanners could have on unborn children. That's true. I didn't think about that. <laughs> I, I mean, from what I've heard and what I've, I've seen online and, and so forth, is it, the radiation is really minimal. So I, personally, I, I think if, if, that's, if that's something that you're worried about, probably should figure out a, a different way to, to get to where you're going. Well, I'm glad they're doing that. I don't, I don't like being patted at all. Well, some, pet, pet somebody else, okay? <laughs> well, I, I agree. I agree with you on that one. I got patted down. What did you think about it? It was uh, very traumatic for me. <laughs> what did you think about your wife going through if she was pregnant? Well, I'm sure there's probably needs to be more research to find out if it actually happens or not. It's interesting to note that the shining example for why body scanners are used in the first place is the underwear bomber, a person who was allowed through the security checkpoint many years ago. Meanwhile, a man was able to transport a pistol through security just this year. Also, even though the TSA has yet to stop a single terrorist attack, we saw the state of Texas threatened with a no-fly zone when they sought to oust the agency. And finally, activist John Corbett, who was previously censored by the TSA for posting documents that they themselves released, is suing the agency over the pat-down rule change. And there you have it. More reports at InfoWars.com. The ghetto, not the place you would imagine methods of global dominance to spring from. 
But it was in the ghettos across the United States that Saul Alinsky would fine-tune tactics of civil disobedience that would one day be employed by New World Order puppet Barack Hussein Obama. Resolutions of ideal problems always carry with in their wake another problem. Alinsky's Rules for Radicals is the left's playbook, chock full of creeping tactics used by scheming politicians and Soros-fueled millennial generation groups like Black Lives Matter. hell-bent on tearing the fabric of American society apart. The anti-cop rhetoric that, has, that is sweeping the United States of America, fueled by this group, some of the vulgar, vile, vicious rhetoric that's coming out, talking about killing cops. Alinsky's albeit deceptively noble attempt to create a system to reward the have-nots with the power and surplus of the haves would prove to be just as useful for the New World Order sycophants to achieve an uprooting of American values and an overpass of the United States Constitutional Foundation to be replaced by totalitarianism disguised as compassionate socialism. These tactics simply needed the perfect charismatic turncoat to steer them. Enter Barack Obama. All of us want to give our president every tool necessary to do this. And all of us were willing to do that in this bill. And anyone who says otherwise is lying to the American people. Saul Alinsky died decades before a young pre-Senate Barack Obama would spend three years following in Alinsky's footsteps as a community organizer. In 2009, the National Review stated, Obama's mentors from his Chicago days studied at a school Alinsky founded, and they taught their students the philosophy and methods of one of the first community organizers. Saul Alinsky wrote in Rules for Radicals, as an organizer, I start from where the world is, as it is, not as I would like it to be. That we accept the world as it is doesn't in any sense weaken our desire to change it into what we believe it should be. It is necessary to begin where the world is if we are going to change it to what we think it should be. That means working in the system. So what are some of the tactics being utilized in that system at accelerating degrees in the shaping of modern American society? Rule number one, power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Obama and the nutjobs in the nation's capital would have us all believe that they have overwhelming support from the have-nots while destroying the middle class, increasing the debt and welfare class to unsustainable levels, and projecting it all from their mainstream media bubble. Rule number two, never go outside the expertise of your people. Basically, why bother engaging in a rational debate based on facts with your adversary? Simply bring up the despised policies or traditions and belittle them until they're crushed. Less than loving expressions by Christians? No, no, no. I get concerned. That's right. Let's criticize Christianity on Easter, you piece of crap. That's a topic for another day. Skipping to rule number eight, keep the pressure on. Never let up. Obama must say this rule to himself every morning. As one shoe drops, another one is ready to fall. Not in the manner of a leader responding to a country's pleas in the midst of a crisis, but more in the vein of a tyrant, quietly and charismatically creating them while offering shallow direction as stale as his predecessor's rhetoric. And if just that sample of Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals wasn't enough, Alinsky even dedicated the left's playbook to Lucifer himself. I suppose, given a choice, I think I would uh, pick hell. The reason I'd pick hell is because that's where all the have-nots are. John Bound for Infowars.com. As a community moves towards despotism, respect is restricted to fewer people. That's veteran Denver police officer Charles Jones IV smashing an unarmed suspect in the face six times. Officers accused of using excessive force on a suspect and then trying to erase the evidence. Of I'm, I'm observing what they're doing in their me. I don't understand what's going on. A community rates low on an information scale. When the press, radio, and other channels of communication are controlled by only a few people, 
Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? How can you ask such a question? What difference at this point does it make? When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in the community, he looks beyond...